Well, the house that I grew up in had an amazing backyard. It was an awesome backyard for kids. It had this beautiful sprawling lawn with garden trim that went all around the outside of it. It had a cubby house. It had a sand pit. It had homemade football goals and a cricket pitch where I made my first century and kicked my first hundred goals. And it had a vegetable garden where we used to pick tomatoes. It had this beautiful peach tree and every year that would produce these, uh, this l- these lush peaches. It had a back fence with a, with a gate, a door that opened out to this huge gully where me and my sisters would escape through uh, many, many times. It was actually the site of my first game of Kiss Chasey. This garden was an absolute kid's paradise, a kid's heaven. And when I was little, all I did was enjoy it. That's all I did. I went out into the garden and I just enjoyed it. But then one day my mum and dad called me and they asked me to do something in the garden that I'd never done before. They handed me some gloves and they said, son, come over here, weed the garden. And so I spent the afternoon on my hands and knees knees pulling out the weeds in this garden and then my dad after that showed me how to push the lawnmower and so I learned how to push the lawnmower while my sisters would uh, water the plants and this became a regular weekend activity before we could actually enjoy the garden we actually had to work in the garden now the problem is is at the beginning this was quite a novelty for me I quite enjoyed it but after a little while it became a drag. And the, re- the, the reason is, is because that I had only the expectation to work, to enjoy the garden and not the expectation to enjoy, to, to work in the garden. The expectation to enjoy it without the expectation to work in it. Well, a garden is actually a great metaphor for marriage because we often have that same expectation. The expectation to enjoy our marriage, but without the expectation to actually work in the marriage. Now most of us, we actually, we enter a marriage and we expect it to be like the botanic gardens. Lush, fresh, birds and bees, but often it's not that way at all. You see, think about it. It is actually a long way from planting an apple seed all the way to a fruit producing apple tree, isn't it? When you plant an apple seed, it takes a long time to get to a fruit producing apple tree. When you're working in the garden, you can be weeding one day and and go inside satisfied with your work, go out the back door the next day and there's already weeds shooting up, isn't there? For a garden to be healthy, what does it need? It needs a constant gardener, a constant gardener. Now, at the risk of stereotypes, it seems to me that most times men think that the garden needs far less attention than it really does. In fact, three foot high weeds can wait just one more day to be pulled. And maybe sometimes women might see the tiniest little shoot coming out of the garden and see it as a chance to get hubby off the couch to come and pull it up straight away. Don't let me do stereotypes with you. It could be the other way around, but perhaps it's like that in our household. But marriage is a garden. You can't just plant it and expect, you know, go away for six months and come back and expect it to still be there. But at the same time, you actually need to have patience. You actually need to give it an opportunity to grow. Otherwise, what is actually in the garden, you'll never actually enjoy. And so that's what we're going to be looking at this series. Marriage like a garden. Over the next four weeks, we're going to look at four things. We're going to look at planting. That's what we're going to look at this morning. Planting the purpose, planting the roles, planting the mindset for marriage. Then we're going to look at watering for healthy communication. Then we're going to look at weeding out bitterness, weeding out conflict. And then lastly, we're going to look at harvesting a marriage of friendship, of spiritual life, and harvesting the enjoyment of our marriage. And each week, what I'm going to do is just give you one choice, just one One choice every week that you can make, both individually and as a couple, to to foster a healthy marriage. Now, 
This series is not just for married couples. This series is a, for people who want to be married, people who are dating, young marrieds, people who have been married for 30 or 40 years. You never stop learning these things. But it's also, some people might, of you might think, well, marriage is probably never going to be in my life. One thing I'd say is, well, don't discount what the Lord may do. But secondly, these principles actually apply to all significant relationships. All relationships that you actually harness and foster in your life, these principles will be true for. And so this morning, first up, we're going to look at planting. Planting the purpose, planting the roles, and planting the mindset that you need for a healthy marriage. So firstly, the purpose. In ancient cultures, essentially the purpose of marriage was that you married for security. You married for economic security, for social security, uh, and the idea was for the forward flourishing of your family. And so rather than what we see today where people marry for, you know, attraction or, you know, all these different types of things, romance, all these things, back in the ancient times, that wasn't a factor. It, we didn't have dating sites and all these kinds of things. People actually married for the forward flourishing of their family. What we know now in modern times is that most of all people marry for happiness. We, we choose uh, the partner that we think will make us most happy. And as soon as we're not happy, then we these days have the freedom to just decide not to be with that person anymore. Well, the thing is, a qualifier here, is that we don't see marriage as uh, anti-security. Of course, security is one very important factor about marriage. And we also, it's not anti-happiness. But what the Bible presents is that both of those things on their own are actually naive when it comes to what God's actual purpose is for marriage. But why? Why is that? Why are those things naive? It's because both of them present a consumer attitude, a consumer mindset toward, uh, toward marriage. Now let me describe a consumer mindset uh, uh, attitude to you. I have a coffee drinking habit and the foundation of my uh, coffee drinking habit is a consumer attitude. I would go to a, a coffee place that would charge $5 for a large coffee. But then, just recently, I found out that there's another place nearby that only charges $4.80 for a large coffee. And so I have, didn't even give it a second thought. I have no problem in actually abandoning the place that charges $5 to go to the place that charges $4.80. Why? Because my need for my co for coffee drinking habit is, is greater than my relationship with that place is greater than my need for the, my relationship with that bar barista. Why? Because it's a consumer attitude. It's what I, what I get out of it. I take what I can get out of it. And many people actually approach marriage that exact same way. Because the purpose is happiness, it's just a consumer relationship. I'll be the spouse I ought to be if and when you're the spouse you ought to be. That's how it works, a consumer kind of relationship. But the biblical picture of marriage, it doesn't present it that way at all. I want you actually to take your Bibles now. If you've got one, grab it, grab it open up to Ephesians 5, or to open up your phone and look up to Ephesians 5. I want you to actually today really look down at your Bibles to see this truth in the text. And first of all, look at verse 31. It says this, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast, or in another version it says, or be joined to his wife. Now, be joined here is actually a carpenter's term. It means to actually fix two planks of timber together so tightly that they cannot be separated, so that they do not come apart. Now, this is Paul actually picking up uh, from Genesis 2 at the very first marriage between Adam and Eve. The two shall become one flesh. And so the biblical image here is not a consumer attitude, it's not a consumer relationship, but actually it's a covenant relationship. It's a fixing together, a coming together, two in one flesh. Now, look here in verse 32, because the very next verse, because it kind of does just give us some more light what's going on here. This mystery, it says, is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So here's the point Paul's making. If we want to know anything about marriage, we have to examine the relationship, the profound relationship 
that Christ has with his church. In fact, marriage is not actually the main thing that Paul is talking about here. Uh, you notice this? Marriage is actually the illustration that Paul is using. This is actually primary teaching on the profound relationship between Christ and his church, and Paul is just saying it's like marriage. He's using the illustration of marriage. But then in verse 33, he does actually say, but it is about marriage too, guys. Yeah, it, just, just check it out there in verse 33. He says, however, it, it is actually about respecting and loving one another. And so to look deeply at that relationship, the relationship between Jesus and the church, you could simply ask this question. Did Jesus come to earth as a fickle consumer? Did Jesus come to earth to take from you? Did he come willing to pay a certain price, but then find a cheaper price? Well, have a look in verse 25. To the contrary... Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Why? Verse 27, if you have a pen, you could circle these words. So that. So that is, what is the purpose. This is the purpose here. He goes on to purpose. He might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or without blemish. So what's the purpose of marriage? Some say security. Some say happiness, but God says that marriage is a mini church that mirrors the sacrificial service that Christ made to bring the church into being. It's a mini church that Christ sacrificed for because he loves the church. And so Tim Keller, he describes this, this whole section, as gospel reenactment. Now what is a reenactment? A reenactment is a acting out of a real past event. Now, for the gospel, that is that Christ laid down his life for you so that you could know future glory. Now, think about why you got married. If you've been married, think about why you got married. Most of us, if you're anything like me, got married out of a feeling that you had about the other person's beauty. Inner beauty, outer beauty, whatever. But it was some sort of feeling that you had about that person's beauty. But then, we hit a few bumps in marriage and we realized that it would actually need something a bit stronger. It would need something a bit more uh, to carry, to ca you know, stronger to carry it forward. And I know for me, many times the consumer attitude was at work in my heart. I'll be the spouse that I ought to be if and when you are the spouse that you ought to be. But if you're into the purpose of marriage as gospel reenactment, you're looking at it differently. You're looking at it in the way that Christ served the church. I'll be the spouse I ought to be, whether or not you are the spouse that you ought to be, because Christ showed me spousal love when I wasn't who I ought to be. This is a gospel picture of, of, of marriage. Our purpose in marriage is gospel reenactment, helping your spouse become the future self that God wants them to be. How? by sacrificially serving them. This is the purpose. Helping your spouse be the future self God wants them to be through sacrificial service. This couldn't get further away from the consumer mindset that we have often when it comes to marriage. This is a radical kind of countercultural idea. I will love and an act in a way towards my wife Michelle that takes her all the way to Jesus at the end of her life and says, Here, Lord, she's yours. That, that's the purpose. That's our purpose here in, in marriage. That's what Christ did for the church. That's what he will do when he comes and he brings the church, ushers the church into future glory. This is incredible redefinition of purpose. My purpose with Michelle, it's not to control her, not to exercise domination over her, but to lay myself down for her like Christ did for the church. Same in her role for me. It's not to give me the perks of leadership or you know, you know, to find her security in me or find her happiness in me. It's not that at all. Her purpose is at the end of the day to present me without spot or wrinkle to the Father. This is the purpose. 
So it's one thing to know purpose. I hope that's clear in your mind. But how does this sacrificial service actually take place in marriage? How does it take place? Well, within this purpose, the text actually shows us that God calls a husband and wife to serve one another through Christ-shaped roles, through specifically designed roles. Now, up until now, most people agree with the idea of self Sacrifice. Most, most people understand that the way you make any relationship work is that you actually have to lay yourself down. Most people, uh, people agree with that. I remember when I uh, used to work in state government, uh, I learnt not to get too excited when the federal government made a commitment to us as the state government, an in-principle uh, commitment. Because what they would do is all the politicians would get together and they'd stand in front of the cameras and they'd shake hands and all this sort of stuff. But all us policy people in the back room, the one who would have to deal with the detail, we wouldn't get too excited about that. We would wait until we got the detail. And so we would wait till we got the right people in the room to discuss the detail, and then we'd really find out what people were willing to give up. We'd really find out if the agreement was as exciting as it sounded. Now, the same is true of marriage. We tend to do all the head nodding and all the in-principle agreement and get excited about the sacrificial service but it's always tested in the detail. It's always tested in the detail. The details of Ephesians 5 can get tricky. There's no mistake about that. Because as soon as we hear the word submit, we enter into that conversation that the world is having at the moment about gender roles, don't we? We enter into this, this kind of tricky realm. But we, what we have to see here in this text, we, have to, we, can't, let's not, we can't be simplistic. We have to see that Paul is speaking about something so much broader, so much bigger than just gender roles. Paul is actually describing three roles here in marriage. And the first is not the wife, and the first is not the husband, but the first is actually the role of the Holy Spirit. The role of the Spirit. Take a look back before what, what Anita read out for us today at verse 21, just the verse before. It says, Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, that is the last statement in a long sentence that started way back in verse 18. And so look at verse 18. It says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then there's a whole list of instructions or outworkings of the Holy Spirit, like singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And so Paul here is just declaring that everything that he is about to say about marriage and about roles assumes that the wife and the husband are being filled with the Holy Spirit. They're actually being filled. They're, 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 whole, uh, they're informed by the Holy Spirit. What does this actually mean? It means that the Spirit takes these truths about Jesus the roles that Jesus played and makes them sing in our own heart, makes us believe them, makes us, makes us clear on them about what they mean. It means that you first are submitted to the Spirit in your life, not to anything else but to the Spirit. It means, interestingly, that you already know who you are in God. You already know that because the Spirit lives inside you. So you're not defined by your husband and your wife. Your, your identity is secure in God because the Spirit lives in you. Your, your, your happiness is not found in your partner. See, you know when the Spirit lives in you, when you're being filled with the Spirit, I don't know if you ever experienced this, a filling of the Spirit, you know you don't need to cling on to your rights, uh, onto, your, onto these so-called rights that we think we have. You actually, when you're filled with the Spirit, you're willing to lay down your rights. And so this is what Paul is assuming so far. He's assuming that a husband and a wife are being filled with the Spirit. And everything that he says afterwards on marriage assumes that point. Now, what does this mean, to be filled with the Spirit? I mean, that's another sermon. But it basically means this, that the Spirit teaches you. The Spirit guides you. The Spirit convicts you. The Spirit brings joy to you. The Spirit is the down payment of your future glory. He gives you confident assurance of your hope. And how are we filled? Well, it's through letting the Word confront you. I have to admit this week, as I read the text again on marriage, I realized that I have let cultural things inform my idea of what marriage is. And I had to be submitted to the Scripture. I had to let the Scripture confront me again. 
with, with these truths. So we, this is what we do. We let the scripture confront us. We confess known sin. We, we have to pursue pure lives. We have to have a conscience presence every day with us that the Lord is with us. Now, this is the truth on this. This is the summary of Paul's statement on this. Only if you allow the Spirit to play his role in your life can you play your role in marriage. Only if you allow the Spirit to play his role in your life can you play your role in marriage. And that all results in verse 21, where there is a general sense of call to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. See that? Out of awe for Christ, we're going to submit to one another. But then... Paul does get specific in talking immediately about the role of the wife. He says to the wife, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. What does Paul recognize here? Coming from a general call of submission to go specific, what does he reckon? He recognizes that mutual submission has a junction. Mutual submission has a junction to it. Otherwise, mutual submission would look like two people about to enter through the same door. And the first says, you go first. And then the second says, no, you go first. And then the first says, no, but I'm supposed to submit to you. And the second says, no, but I'm supposed to submit to you. And so no one walks through the door. And so Paul recognizes that mutual submission has a junction to it. Now, because verse 25 immediately says, husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church, perhaps he is placing on the husband an even greater responsibility to not just expect to walk through the door whenever he pleases, pulling, dragging his wife through the door, but actually that oftentimes he should constantly and consistently lay down his life and let her walk through before him, out of his love for her. Now, Michelle and I talked about this this week. It's always in the detail, right? And so we talked about it this week. When in our 10-year marriage... Have, has this kind of come up, this whole idea of, of wives submitting to husbands. And to be honest, there was only really two times in our 10-year marriage that we could actually think about a time where I decided to walk through the door ahead of my wife and my family. The first time was when I went into ministry in 2012, when I sensed the call to go into ministry. And Michelle didn't sense that call. She, she wasn't excited about that idea at all. We were on a different path, and I was saying, let's go on, a, on, this, on this path. And that, that was a process. And so it came to a point where she actually said, I am going, I'll follow you through the door. I, I will, you make the decision, I'll follow you through the door. The second time was when I wanted to go to the States to study, to further my, my theologi theological education. And Michelle said at the time, I would prefer not to do this. But again, she came to a place of saying, I will let you decide and I will follow you. Now, at times in that whole, that sounded simplistic, but at times I felt like dragging her through the door. I, I felt like there was objections being raised that, that I didn't understand. But I realized quite quickly that I couldn't do that, that it wasn't loving, that it wasn't playing my role, and so I didn't drag her through the door. I held her hand until she was ready. I waited until she was ready uh, to walk through with me, and we did. We walked through the door holding hands. And the overwhelming sense of this passage is that this is a team, and that the team has roles, and the roles are planned for the good of the individual and the team. This is the overwhelming sense of this passage. Uh, it's the dynamic mix of, of a wife submitting and a husband loving, and, and how that actually works. Uh, the problem is, comes is often when both the husband and wife, and wife are trying to squeeze through the door at the same time, trying to push through both of their agendas at the same time, and usually we get stuck. But the other, the other problem comes, is, it can come, is when uh, the roles are either despised or they're abused. Despised or abused. And, and we can see problems emerge then as well. And so I actually want to look, firstly, at the role of a wife, just some observations to share with you about this. The first observation about the role of the wife is this. They are roles, not rank. They're roles, not rank. Genesis 1, verse 27 says, so God created man, man is an expression for all of humanity there, in his own image. 
That is incredible bestowing of God's glory on humanity, the dignity of humanity, that he would create humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he strengthens, he reiterates this, he created him. Male and female, he created him. What is being communicated here is that the glory of God has been bestowed on humanity, both male and female, equally. Equally. This is not a matter of rank. This is a matter here, this teaching of roles. Man was, man and woman were created with, with, with the idea of royalty. And they are equal in the way that God's glory has been bestowed on them. So this is not a matter of equality or inequality. Number two, note, note that it says, wives submit to your own husbands. Wives submit to your own. This is not a call for women to be submissive to all men. This is not the call of this text at all. This is to be submissive to a husband that they own. Do you see that? You're being called to submit to someone that you also own, have ownership of. And we see that in other, in other texts that, that a, a man owns his wife's body and a wife owns his husband's body. And so you're called to submit to someone that you own. And the distortion of culture is that, that has developed over centuries is that it's a man's world. It's a man's world. But this is not the result of Christian teaching. That is the result of the fall. That this distortion that this world is a man's world. You are called to submit to your own husband, not to men. Thirdly, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Note this, wives. Your submission is not an act of worship to your husband. Your submission is an act of worship to God. It's, it's a calling that God has placed on your life. And so a husband cannot, should not demand submission. It, it, it's a willing submission. He's not the idol. He's not the lounge chair God. He's not the one with the perks. You bow to the Lord because he calls you to do it in his good judgment and wisdom. But the most powerful of all, observation of all, is that where does this idea of willing submission find its embodiment? Well, just a few pages over in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, we see that Jesus did not count equality with God something to be grasped, even though he was equal with God. He did not count it something to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. So I think the best and most significant and comforting reason for a wife to su willingly submit to her husband is that it is a role that Jesus gladly and willingly took upon himself. This is a Christ-like response to God. I heard one woman speak about this this week, and she really struggled with this practically. She struggled with what this actually meant. But then she said this, as soon as I realized that willing submission was part of Christ's obedience, I could no longer despise the role myself. I could no longer see it if it wasn't an assault on Christ for him to willingly submit. If it wasn't an assault on him, then it's not an assault on me. If he was willing to submit, then I'm willing to submit. I don't want to despise that role that Christ played for the church. And I can sort of, I hear the objection. Well, that's all very well for Jesus. His father was perfect. But my husband thinks that he has a blank check to do what he pleases. And the answer is, is that submission does not mean that you willingly submit to all a man's wishes. It doesn't mean that you submit to wrongdoing. And we also see in Jesus that he also was one who actually didn't only just submit to his father, but by taking on human flesh, he also submitted himself to man, to sinful man. And Jesus navigated that path with grace and truth. He navigated it through his life. But remember... The goal of marriage is to present the other holy, is to present the other as the way that God, uh, to, to, to encourage and care for them so in the way that God wants them to be in their life. And so it would actually be not serving your husband to allow him to do the wrong thing and not confront it and not say, that's not okay. In fact, that is actually what a wife should do. A wife should have the, the freedom to actually confront her husband and say, 
this is the wrong, this is the wrong thing. Because that is actually part of your purpose, is to present your husband without spot or wrinkle. Now, it's a shame that I have to make this qualification in our culture, but this is true. No woman should translate submitting to her husband as staying silent over physical or sexual abuse. That is against the law. And a man should pay the penalty of doing such a thing. There is, there is, no, there is no concept here that a woman should stay silent under those circumstances. But the call on a wife is this, to not despise the role of wife because Jesus willingly submitted to the Father for the church to come into being, for the church to experience unity. But now we look at the role of the husband. Immediately after, Paul puts a, um, a call on the husband. He says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now the observations we see about this is firstly, it's freedom not force. It's leading with freedom, not force. Jesus was the ultimate gentleman. Do you notice about Jesus? Jesus never went anywhere trying to force someone to follow him. He never did. God in salvation doesn't force anyone to believe in him. He gives people freedom of choice. And so if a man reads this and it produces anything other than gentlemanly behavior, then it is sin. And so a husband's leadership should actually create freedom for his wife. It should actually encourage and bless and give her the opportunity to grow in her gifts and live out the calling that God has on her life. Secondly, we see, an observation we see, is that Jesus gained by dying. Jesus didn't gain by trampling. And we often see this in leadership. People often approach leadership by trampling or they flatten people or they, they roll over the top of people's desires. But Christ, he actually rose to the head of the church by dying, by laying down his life. And so this is how we see a husband is to lead. They gain their authority and leadership by dying, by laying down their life. Thirdly, we see that the role of a husband is spiritual, not just social. It's not just a horizontal relationship, but it's actually taking leadership and having accountability for the spiritual health of the home. The concept of partnership is, is true, but it's also incomplete. Have a look at the, the descriptions that Paul uses. He, he uses one flesh, one, that, that a husband and wife actually become one. So much so that he treats her as he does his own body his own body. And so this is the call on, on, a, on a husband is not just to have this horizontal social relationship with his wife, but actually lead her spiritually for, for health. Christ is not just a partner of the church. Christ is the head of the church and we are his body. And then lastly, uh, so spiritual and social, and then lastly is oneness, oneness and not partnership. But I can hear the objection as well. I'm not Jesus. I mean, I often felt that pressure. I'm not Jesus. I know Jesus lived this out perfectly. He gained, he, he, he won people's, you know, uh, affection and, and submission by freedom, not force, by gaining, dying. He's spiritual, not social. Oneness, not partnership. But I'm not like that. I'm not perfect like him. Well, remember this. You are the leader of a mini church. And while you are the leader of the marriage, Christ is is the head of you. Christ is the leader of you. Verse 23 says, he himself is the church's saviour. He is the church's saviour. And so your imperfect leadership is actually empowered and inspired and made perfect by the powerful leadership of Christ. And that includes his grace. That includes that when you do it the wrong way, when you fail in your leadership as a husband, that God is gracious toward you, to help you to, to do it the way that he, he wants. And so the call of the husband is to not abuse your headship, not abuse your leadership role that Jesus played by laying down his life through servanthood. Keep your eyes on the ultimate gentleman. Take your lead from him and receive grace from him when you fail. You know, many people today, including many Christians, are uh, have chosen to throw out this teaching on cultural grounds. Because I admit, it is a difficult teaching to understand in the world that we live in. 
But I want you to see this, is that when you examine this text like we have today, Paul does not use cultural arguments. He uses timeless, universal ones. The most primary being, firstly, creation, the creation of male and female, and the second thing is um, the profound mystery, Christ's relationship with church. That is not defined by culture. That is not defined by anything other than a, a timeless, universal, uh, ongoing uh, reality, that Christ is the head of his church, and they're the two foundations that Paul uses to explain this kind of truth, that the Son of God would actually uh, humble himself in, her, in submission only to be highly exalted by the Father. And he is redeeming and he is preparing a future glory for both the wife and the husband. You see this? We are called not to abuse the role of headship because Christ did not abuse it. And secondly, we're not to despise the role of submission because Christ willingly played it. And this is actually the model that Jesus is, that Paul is using to say brings about unity in marriage, fulfills that purpose through roles. And so what choice, I want to ask you, what choice do you need to make today to take a step towards living out the purpose and the roles of marriage? If you're like me, it's a constant work in progress, a constant work in progress. We are not setting up marriage as this thing, this benchmark that everyone has to hit. Remember, it takes a long time for an apple seed to become a fruit-producing tree. But what decision do you need to make today? I remember just a couple of years ago, Michelle and I just weren't kind of aligning. We weren't, we weren't connecting. And the reason was, was because I was so busy. And so I was out too many nights a week and I had my mind, and every time I was at home, I was thinking about other things. And Michelle looked at my life and she saw me as somebody who was investing in a lot of other people, but not actually her. And I was so busy. And I was frustrated because I felt like she wasn't seeing what I did as important. And so we were just having this misalignment. And what, what's the only thing that will break that deadlock? What's the only thing that started to break that deadlock? was when we made a choice. We had to choose a ministry mindset. Choose a ministry mindset. This is the first choice that you must make to build a healthy marriage. In the same way that Christ ministered to his church by laying down his life for the church, this is the mindset that we need to make. We need all to choose a ministry mindset, to have that purpose in our minds. And that may mean that we have to actually repent from a self-serving mindset. We have to actually turn from that and turn to this. You know what? My heart's desire is actually that um, Michelle would be the woman that God wants her to be. Um, so choose a ministry mindset. I hear this question. If I put the happiness of my spouse ahead of my own needs, then what do I get out of it? And if you're asking that, then maybe you've never truly served your spouse because you would already have known what you actually get out of it. The irony of this is that you get happiness, right? You get happiness. It's better to give than receive. See this. The purpose of marriage, as we said at the beginning, is not happiness. But if you live out the true purpose of marriage, you'll get it. You'll get happiness in the end. And this is why today we must choose a ministry mindset. And so right now, what I want to do is I want to show you this video which goes for about six or seven minutes just to see how radical and powerful a ministry mindset can be for our marriages.